Carbohydrates, we love them. But newspaper headlines keep telling us how bad they are for our health. Are they the killer, as claimed by many, responsible for record levels of obesity and diabetes? How do we recognise them? And how do we become much smarter with the carbs we're eating? I'm Zahn van Tulliken. I'm a medical doctor, I have a degree in public health, and I absolutely love eating carbs. So much so that I once weighed 19 stone. So I'm on a mission to find out how to be clever with carbs. I'm going to discover how carbs are hidden in foods you never would have expected. So in fact, there's the equivalent of 19 sugar cubes in this jacket potato. How can you eat the carbs you love in a way that's much better for you? For 10 seconds. Could swilling rather than swallowing your favorite sports drink improve your exercise performance? That's 600, 600 meters. meters. If you win a half hour race by 600 meters, you get the gold medal. And could eating the right sort of carbs even increase your fertility? Sometimes you hear about cutting carbs out completely, but that wasn't the message. It was about the type of carbs, not about avoiding carbs. So keep watching, because this is the truth about carbs. Britain is the fattest country in Western Europe, with nearly three in 10 of us classified as obese. The numbers of us suffering from type 2 diabetes is on the rise, along with bowel cancer. And carbs are getting much of the blame because so much of what we eat is packed with them. There's the sugar in this fizzy drink, the bread in the burger bun, the flour coating the chicken, the fries I had while I was waiting, Carbs are really hard to avoid because they're in almost all cheap food and junk food. But what exactly are carbs? I have a tray of different foods, and I'm asking the public which ones they think contain carbs. When I say carbs, what, what would be the kind of things you think of? Potatoes and, and rice and everything there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pasta. Um, Potatoes. What do you think a carb is? I would say a carb is like a wheat or a grain, maybe. I love carbs. Really? Yeah. <laughs> What's your, what are your favourite ones? Uh, biscuits. Love really? Carbs. Well. It's a vegetable. What no one has guessed is that everything in my tray contains carbs. From biscuits and bread to broccoli and beans. So what are carbohydrates? Put simply, they are large molecules containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Along with protein and fat, they're one of the most important nutrients for our bodies. Most people get most of their energy from carbs. There are three kinds of carb, starch, sugar, and fiber. There's a lot of starch in things like potatoes, rice, pasta, and bread. So let's call these the beige carbs. And then there's a lot of sugar in things like fizzy drinks, sweets, and processed foods. So we can call those the white carbs. Once you've eaten them, both starch and sugar get quickly broken down into a smaller molecule called glucose. And that gets dumped into your bloodstream where your body uses it for energy. But if you eat too many carbs, then that glucose can be stored as fat. And that's what's given carbs a bad name. But it's not all bad news. There are some kinds of carb that we're not getting enough of. Fruits and vegetables like these all contain fiber. And fiber is a kind of carbohydrate. It releases energy very slowly. It's very good for our guts. And so stuff like this doesn't tend to make us fat. Now we can call the fiber green carbs, but remember everything in this basket is carbs. So put very simply, the white carbs are sugar, the beige carbs are in all those starchy foods, and the green carbs are fibre. The 
problem is that too many of us are eating way too much of the wrong sort of carby foods. And it all began about 12,000 years ago. When we eased up on the hunter-gathering and figured out how to grow crops. They're right at the heart of our diet. Windmills like Wissendine here in Rutland grind cereals into flour to make bread, pasta, biscuits and cakes. We've evolved to love carbs, but they used to be much harder for us to get. Now, the carbs are all around us. We sit at our desks all day. We've got fatter and fatter, and that's why carbs have been demonised. On average, we'll eat seven tonnes of white and beige carbs over our lifetime. And because these starchy foods are everywhere, they can be very difficult to avoid. So, how many carbs can I eat? Well, the truth is that some of you can eat almost as many as you like, while others, like me, have to watch it. A geneticist, Dr. Sharon Molam, has come up with a really easy test to figure out which type of carb eater you might be. To try it out, I've assembled a group of volunteers, students. I have in my tray bags of crackers, which have got starch in, like flour. So what I'm going to do is you're each going to take a cracker. I'm going to time you. And all I want you to do is when I say, put the cracker in your mouth, start chewing, and let me know when it changes flavour. You might feel it's tasting a bit more sweet or it may be some other flavour taste. Stick your hand up. I'm going to record the time. If it doesn't change flavour, that's fine too. OK, you ready? On your marks, get set. Go. Seventeen seconds. Twenty-three seconds. Twenty-nine seconds. Thirty-five seconds. Go on, keep going. Nothing? No, not You're not getting anything, Jackie. No? Yeah. Uh, nothing at all. That's all right. That's, that's legit, Jackie. You're allowed to have no change. So the results are very interesting. I'm going to start with Rochelle and Phil, you both had the fastest time you noticed that the change in was 17 seconds. Now, that is quite fast. And what that suggests is that you have a high concentration of amylase enzymes in your mouth. And those enzymes are chopping up the big starch molecules into smaller molecules of, of sugar or sugar-like molecules that you can taste. That means you two should be able to eat a lot of carbs without having any problems. Now, the next four, now you're going much more slowly, and that suggests that probably you should watch your carb intake. You're doing okay with carbs, they're not a big problem, but you probably can't go to town in the same way that Rochelle and Phil could. And then finally, Shani and Jackie, you really didn't notice a change at all. Now, Dr. Molam suggests that that's because you have a low concentration of amylase enzymes in your mouth, and that suggests that you might struggle eating carbs. It's still early days with this research, but the cracker test demonstrates just how varied our tolerance for carbs is. To try this test at home, use a small, unsalted cracker. If, like me, the taste doesn't change after 30 seconds, then you might want to ease off the white and beige carbs. Just a bit. So just where do all these white and beige carbs lurk in our food? Well, looks can be deceiving. Dietitian Alison Barnes wants to show a group of office workers just how much energy in the form of sugar these carbs release into their bloodstream. OK, so I've lined up a selection of foods. We've got a bagel and a chocolate muffin. OK, so... I would say that th that is more sugar than this one. Maybe two cubes for that one? We're calling this blood sugar bingo. Can our volunteers guess the equivalent cubes of sugar in each of these foods? What let's, do you think? Yeah, let's... Five to make let's it... Go, let's go five. OK. So you've gone for the, the muffin as the slightly higher one. I'm just going to add to that. Oh, oh, whoa. <laughs> Double. Oh, wow. my... Okay. So ten sugar cubes in that muffin. This one, so you've gone for two, so it's more starchy, less sugary? Yeah, less sugary. Okay. Yes, what we're guessing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So let's just add to this one. Oh. Well. Wow. Uh, maybe not. 
That's the same as the muffin. <laughs> I'm going to add one more. More sugar. Oh, so there's 11 sugar cubes <laughs> equivalent okay. in this bagel. I'm shocked, I won't lie, I'm mm. shocked. Yeah. What you're saying is that in the bagel, when you eat it, you chew it up and start to digest it, your body is breaking that starch down into that quantity of sugar. The equivalent of sugar, yeah, yeah, wow. exactly. This is a, a portion of white rice, and then you've got a nice bowl of strawberries. The rice. Yes, let's go for five. Because I would never have put sugar with rice. <laughs> strawberries. I would have put half of that bowl. <laughs> <laughs> they are sweet. Two more, yeah. OK, so in this amount of strawberries, there is... <gasps> four sugar cubes. Mm, wow. So, yeah, so although they taste sweet, actually the amount of carbohydrate that they contain is, is quite small. So let's compare that to this portion of rice, then. Oh, no. So you've gone for five, so just let oh, me... Oh, no. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to do this. I'm not eating oh, rice boy. again. <laughs> Oh, word. Oh, my God. Really? It's grains of sugar that we're eating. OK, I'm not actually. eating rice it's no more. Not, not there. So that is... That's 20 sugar cube equivalents. Jack of potato. Yeah. Can you not do that? It's my favourite food, potato. <laughs> <laughs> I would go with... Similar to the bagel, yeah? yeah like it's about 10. You've got quite a good poker face, Alison. <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, there's, there's 19 sugar cubes wow. in this. In this jacket potato, it's almost <laughs> almost double what you thought. And I'm so sorry, I'm Hannah. Cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, sure. it's yeah. a shock where where they hide in all the sugar. I think one of the one of the key things to take away from this is that looks can be deceiving. Mm. So just because a food doesn't necessarily taste sweet, doesn't mean that there's not going to be sometimes an awful lot of sugar going mm -hmm. into your, your system after you've eaten it. The thing that this really rams home for me is that there is a huge amount of energy in a potato and that pile of glucose there that will, your body will turn the potato into will be stored as fat unless you burn it off. Unless you so burn it off. You have to be careful about what you're putting in your mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what should we be eating instead of all these sugary carbs? Well, there's fibre. Most of us could use a bit more of that. But there's also resistant starch. Now, resistant starch resists digestion, and it's a type of fibre. It travels all the way down to our large intestine and goes to work feeding our gut bacteria. And I want to show you how good it is for you and the surprising ways you can get more of it into your diet. But first, I need to discover how much resistant starch I'm eating. To do that, I gave a poo sample to get the bacteria in my gut analysed. The analysis has done two things. It's looked at the profile of your microbes, particularly the dominant ones that we believe to be largely beneficial or certainly harmless. But it's also done a more targeted analysis of uh, potentially harmful bacteria. Uh, and, and other microorganisms that might cause disease. You don't have a lot of uh, ruminococcus uh, detected in this sample, which suggests to me that you don't have high consumption resistant starch, because one of the main species of ruminococcus is a specialist degrader of resistant starch. Now, resistant starch is your area of expertise, isn't it? Yes. So I should be eating more resistant starch. What does, what does that mean and why should I be doing it? OK, so... Resistant starch is a, is a form of fiber. Most of the starch that we eat is digestible, about 95% of it, but there is a small fraction that gets through to the large intestine where it can then be acted on by gut bacteria. Uh, so that's what we define as resistant starch. These are carbohydrate molecules that get through our small gut and into our large Absolutely. gut. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Would it make a big difference if people increased the amount of fiber and resistant starch they were eating? Undoubtedly it would. I think that there's very good evidence um, that that increased fibre intake and resistant starch intake uh, is, is important in, in suppressing that infection and disease. Actually seeing these friendly little bacteria, it does inspire me to change my diet. Good. I'm pleased to hear it. Which is what I need to do. <laughs> so resistant starch feeds the bacteria in my gut, like ruminococcus, which in turn keep me healthy. But I'm not eating enough resistant starch. So how can I get more in my diet? 
I'm going to show you a way of eating more guilt-free carbs. And to do that, surprisingly, I've come to a bakery. Bread. It's one of our favourite and most highly consumed carbs. We eat over 140 million slices every day. And about 60% of this is white bread, full of starch, which quickly gets digested into glucose. So is there a type of bread we should be eating instead? Head baker Julian Carter is going to show me. All right, so these are some we baked last night. Um, that one, that's the Borodinsky, that's the pumpernickel. It's in a smaller tin, that one. Borodinsky. Pumpernickel. Pumpernickel. Yeah, I'll get a knife and we'll cut them up. This one contains none of the grains. But you can see that it's, it's got a chewy texture holes. to it, yeah? If you look at the texture to the bread, it's like malt loaf almost. Let me, have, let me, let me start with this oh, one. Oh, absolutely. That is very delicious. It's got a Rich huge amount of flavour. Yeah. Whole grain loaves contain resistant starch molecules and fibre, which our bodies struggle to break down into glucose. This is a totally different kind of food to a white bread. Is that yeah. a reasonable way yeah, of thinking it, it, about it? Completely different. It's a completely different process, completely different product at the end of the day. The only way you can get the whole grain into your bread is to stone grind it. And the only way you do that is to put it in a windmill between two stones where the whole thing comes through and comes out to the end. Then all you need to do is add water to that to make bread. It really is that simple. That is amazing. Next time you're in your local supermarket, look out for the whole grain loaves. But do check the sugar content because some mass-produced brands add sugar to counteract the bitterness of the whole grain. But there's some good and surprising news if you can't stop eating bread. Stick the loaf in the freezer. This turns some of the easily digested starch in bread into resistant starch. Then toast the slice direct from the freezer. Amazingly, the act of freezing and then toasting means that your body gets far fewer calories from the bread. In effect, the resistant starch feeds your gut bacteria rather than feeding you. It really is that simple. And what about potatoes, rice and pasta? Those foods we all love, but which contain the beige carbs that can make us fat. Well, scientists have discovered that cooking and cooling turn some of the refined starch into resistant starch in these foods too, which your gut bacteria will love. And it's even better to reheat and make sure everything, especially the rice, is piping hot. This further increases the resistant starch content. But why is this? Imagine that this is a starch molecule, say the kind you find in pasta in a lasagna dish. What you can see is that it's made up of a long chain of sugar molecules joined by bonds. And when you digest starch, your enzymes break those bonds and give you individual sugar molecules. Now, when food is cooked and then cooled down again, fats and oils in the surrounding food attach themselves to the starch molecule, and that makes it harder to digest. And then if you take that cooked food and heat it up again, more fats and oils attach themselves to the starch molecule. And that's one of the ways that we get resistant starch. How else can we make carbs work for us? They might have a bad reputation when it comes to our diet, but carbs can improve your performance in the gym. I'm going to show you a way to have your cake and eat it. We're always told that exercise forms an important part of a healthy lifestyle. But we're often being told this by the same companies that are trying to sell us carb-laden sports drinks and supplements. So what I want to know is do carbs and exercise mix? People certainly think they do because sports supplements are a multi-million pound industry. Now, I've always thought that carbs are a pretty good fuel. If I'm going to the gym, I'll bring a carb drink or maybe even some jelly babies. But do I really need those extra carbs to exercise? Dr. Howard Hurst is carrying out research into the effects of carb drinks on our bodies at the University of Central Lancashire. 
So what I want to know is what do carbohydrates do for us when we're exercising? Okay. Are you feeling fit? Yes. Okay, we've got a bike set up. So why don't you hop on? Howard is getting me to do two 30-minute time trials. I will be rinsing my mouth every five minutes for 10 seconds with two of his mystery solutions. The aim is to see which drink increases my performance the most. OK, so if you want to swill that for 10 seconds. But Howard isn't going to tell me which solution is which, and, this is bizarre, I'm not allowed to swallow any of it. OK. Excellent. My speed, the distance cycled, and the calories burned are all being carefully measured by Howard. OK, great effort, Zang. Keep it going. We're nearly there. Push, 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 as you can there, come on. Last couple of seconds. OK, and you can stop. That's the first one done. We'll see you in two days. We'll do it all again. Right, two days' time. I'm going to rest up. Oh. Two days to let my body recover. It's 48 hours since the last bike ride, and I'm back to do exactly the same thing. More swishing, more spitting. Under Howard's watchful eye, I'm now rinsing and spitting the second mystery solution. And the ride really doesn't feel any easier than before. OK, if you want to rinse that for 10 seconds, thanks, man. Keep it going. Three, two, one, and stop. Great effort, Zand. Well done. Do I get the results now? Yeah, if you get your breath back, give me a couple of minutes, and then we'll sit down and we'll have a look at the data. Okay. Can you talk me through what we've been doing, Howard? I've cycled twice, I've rinsed my mouth twice. What are we hoping to prove? Okay. You did two 30 minute time trials. One was with plain water, and one was with a carbohydrate drink. Okay. So what we were trying to do is look at, can you get a performance benefit purely by swilling a carbohydrate mouth solution around your mouth? So I can't see any reason for this to work. I'm not absorbing any, I mean, I'm just rinsing it in my mouth and spitting it all out. So I cannot believe that there'll be any difference between the two cycle rides. Should we see how you got on then? All right. If we have a look at distance first, distance covered in the two 30-minute periods. Condition A was the plain water, and condition B was the carbohydrate mouth rinse. That's an increase in performance. That's, so what is that? That's 600, 600 metres. It's a significant difference, yeah. I mean, if you can win, if you win a half-hour race by 600 metres, you, you get the gold medal, don't you? I mean, that's like a big deal. That's a big difference, yeah. That's mad. Uh, in terms of power output, that was nearly 8% higher in the, in the carbohydrate wow. condition. Do you know how it works? Yep. So the science behind it is there's receptors in the, in the mouth which interact with specific areas of the brain that are responsible for motivation, reward, and motor control. The brain thinks it's going to get carbohydrates, and as a result of that, the athlete self-selects a, a higher exercise intensity. Um, without the, the, the feelings of fatigue. So performance is, is increased. And this is consistent with what uh, a number of other studies have found as well. So even though I'm spitting out the carbs in the sports drink rather than consuming them, the receptors in my mouth are nevertheless telling my brain that it's going to get carbohydrates, which then tells my body that it can work harder. Along with performance benefits, there are also potential benefits for those hoping to lose weight. In the first condition, you burn 440 calories over the, the 30 minutes. In the second condition, you burnt just over 470 kilocalories. When I go to the gym, I can drink two, 300 calories of carb drink through a session, which I think is doing me good, and you're saying it's pretty pointless. Particularly if you want to lose weight, then you may only be putting back in what you're losing. So, in that situation, it would be better to um, 
rinse and, and spit it out. So I'm mad to be drinking my sports drink at the gym when I could just be rinsing my mouth, spitting it out and getting actually a better result. Certainly, um, rinsing it has been shown to be uh, more beneficial than taking on uh, the carbohydrates, um, particularly for exercise lasting less than an hour. Got to have a bucket to spit in. The gym might not be too happy about it. <laughs> Carbs clearly improve performance, but this experiment suggests that it's possible to trick your brain into getting the same result but without the calories when cycling or running between 30 minutes and an hour. Research indicates that you might as well dump the jelly babies and make your own sports drink, just sugar and water, and if it doesn't taste that great, don't worry, because you're simply spitting it out. Just drink water to rehydrate and enjoy your ride. Many doctors and scientists believe that our increasing consumption of the wrong sort of carbs is contributing to significant health problems. A trolley service of drinks and light refreshments is available on this train. As you can see, I'm having my lunch. Now, I know I should be having a salad, but what I really wanted was the pasty. So I think a sandwich is a reasonable compromise, but these are bad carbs. Now, the reason they're bad carbs is that when my body digests the bread, turns it into glucose, that puts my blood glucose up, and that causes my body to release insulin. Insulin is the hormone that controls our blood sugar and keeps it on track. But there's been a worrying increase in the number of people becoming resistant to insulin, causing poor blood sugar control, which can ultimately lead to type 2 diabetes and often a lifetime of medication. Now, it's pretty hard to overstate how dangerous type 2 diabetes is. Blindness, ulcers, heart attacks, strokes, limb loss and ultimately death. It's a disease that is characterised by weight gain. Over three and a half million people in the UK live with type 2 diabetes, and 90% of them are overweight or obese. It's been called the hidden killer because over half a million have yet to have it diagnosed. And many think this disease is on the increase in part because of the type and quantity of the carbs we're eating. So could simply cutting down on all the white and beige carbs and replacing them with more green carbs like fibre and resistant starch be the answer? I'm on my way to meet a family GP who, along with his wife, is trying on a local level to help his patients with type 2 diabetes. And they're doing it with a diet rather than pills and saving the NHS thousands of pounds. Talk me through what the diet is. You're replacing dense carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, with things that are less sugary and less refined. Instead of the chips or the rice or the potatoes, you might have a, a pile of green. I mean, what's often forgotten is actually green veg has got carbohydrate in it. So it's not that you're not having any carbohydrate at all. Is it fair to say that almost everyone in the UK is eating more carbs than they need and more carbs than is good for them. I think that's probably fair. Should everyone be doing this low-carb diet? Really, there is no one diet that suits everybody. I think it's much better to begin with why you, what you're hoping for. And the answer to that will help you decide how low-carb are you going to go. So that if you're not diabetic and you're not overweight, it might be just healthy to give up sugar and reduce the amount of biscuits and refined carbs that you're having. Is sustainability something you've worried about? It depends upon them finding food that they really enjoy. Because you, you have to have a lifestyle that you enjoy. It's not a diet because that implies it's sort of a bit punitive and it's going to end. It's, yeah. it's actually a lifestyle, so you, you shouldn't be suffering because you'll never keep it up. Are calories a big part of this, this diet or this, this lifestyle change? The trouble I have with calories, or indeed weighing, measuring food, that all sounds like a like a diet to me, not like a lifestyle. I just want them to eat healthy food, and it seems to work. So how does Dr Unwin's plan work? 
He reckons it's possible to lose weight and improve your health by making simple changes, like cutting back on white and beige carbs. So what's the science behind this plan? Well, Jaffa Cakes are classic white and beige carbs. They contain refined sugars and starch, and my digestion is breaking that starch down into sugar. So after I've eaten a Jaffa Cake, my blood sugar will now be starting to rise quite quickly. Now, an apple is different. Although this apple contains exactly the same number of calories as those two Jaffa Cakes, the fiber in the apple means the sugar the natural sugar in the fruit gets absorbed much more slowly. That fiber will travel the whole length of my digestive tract, making me feel fuller for longer. So gram for gram with the apple, I get less sugar, and that sugar that could have been stored as fat. That's the theory. Dr. Unwin has arranged for me to meet one of his patients who has been on his low-carb plan for over four years. Is it Chris? Hi, Zand. OK, good to meet you. Very good to meet you. Chris was a type 2 diabetic and on three different kinds of medication. He's brought along some photos of his old self. Like me, he was once seriously overweight. This is what you used to That's look like. That's what I used to look like, Zanz, yeah. Um, so the first one doesn't look that bad. I no. You're a heavy guy, heavy guy yeah. there, heavier guy there, but yeah. that Probably is a the... big man. Yes. How heavy were you at that point? In excess of 19 stone. Yeah, OK, yeah. OK. What was it like being 19 stone? I didn't have half the energy I've got now. Um, That's what I noticed. Person, really. Because I was 19 stone. I yeah. found I was always hungry as well. I was always looking for the next meal. And what? What were the results of going on the program? Immediate weight loss. Um, the, the blood test results that came back, uh, David was extremely pleased. They were very positive. And uh, I went from all, these, all this medication to zero in six months. Wow. Um, I've not taken any medication uh, since, and that's 2013. A lot of doctors just think of diabetes as a permanent disease that you have. That's amazing, isn't it? I understand I'm classed as pre-diabetic. I imagine as long as I follow this program uh, and don't revert to my old ways, that uh, I shall remain uh, pre-diabetic. David is very persuasive, and what Chris has done is really nothing short of a miracle. To get off all those pills is incredible. Chris was part of Dr Unwin's original trial. What I want to know is can we make this work in the real world? Just how hard is it to change your lifestyle and stick to a low-carb diet. This is Kirby on Merseyside. Obesity, type 2 diabetes and heart disease rates here are all above the national average. I've enlisted the help of local GP Faisal Mazarani, who has selected a group of his patients with weight-related health issues. Some do have type 2 diabetes or are considered pre-diabetic. Others are simply obese or have a family history of heart trouble. I'm hoping this experiment will have positive results on all the patient's health. As we've seen, knowing the sugary carbs in food can be a challenge and for diabetics, dangerous. So, before they start the experiment, Dr. Maserani wants to show them the foods they should avoid. Now, each of our volunteers is wearing one of these. This is a blood glucose monitor, and it is continually measuring my blood sugar. So I can check it now. There you go, 4.5. That's all right. So Dr. Maserani wants each of the volunteers to do an experiment using these monitors and he's put the instructions here. I'm going to test to see how certain carbohydrates affect your system, especially in the morning for breakfast. Let's um, have a bowl of fruit and fibre, some semi-skimmed milk, some toast with butter, um, a banana and 200 mils of apple juice. And let's see how that affects your sugar level and how your body responds. First up is Neil. I've been asked to uh, 
have a cereal breakfast to show the difference in glucose, uh, blood sugar glucose before and after. Wholemeal toast. A normal a reading is around six to seven after eating, but a reading of over 11 indicates they are diabetic. Even if you're not diabetic, the truth is that this seemingly healthy breakfast actually contains loads of hidden sugar. In fact, it exceeds the recommended daily allowance in just one meal. The effect on their blood sugar is about the same as an extraordinary 28 cubes of sugar. Well, from 6.4, which is where it was just over an hour ago, before I had the breakfast, it's now 13.6. Left untreated, this level can be very dangerous. Hence, Neil and Phil currently requiring medication to control it. Uh, I'm now just taking a reading. Uh, it has now gone up to 15.5. So it's crucial that our volunteers, especially the diabetic ones, stick to the kinds of carbs that won't push up their blood sugar. So what are their options? Well, I can always try porridge. Not the processed kind, because that releases sugar very quickly, but whole oats, which are high in resistant starch and in fiber. And they can top those off with a few berries, which are also high in fiber and relatively low in sugar. Or you could go to work on an egg. Eggs are no longer considered bad for us and are only 1% carb. It's the first night of our big experiment with our volunteers to swap all those high sugar, white and beige carbs for green carbs. And we're starting with a blowout meal in a local community college restaurant. And by blowout, I mean we're blowing out the unhealthy carbs and introducing good carbs to our seven diners. So instead of seeing a pharmacist, I'm meeting a chef. Hey, I'm Zan. Very good nice to, meet to meet you. you. Thanks very much. So are you doing the meals here? We are, yeah. We're cooking all the meals, the low-carb or smart-carb meals for the, for the patients out front. Can I have a look at what's going on? By all means. So at the moment, we've got Kieran who's uh, making cauliflower rice, and then we've got Chantel who's doing our slow marinated chicken drumsticks, which we make our own Cajun spice. Uh, but it's all the commodities that you have in your own cupboard. I have to say, it smells amazing. It looks really good. And, it, and that is very important because you've got seven people out there whose lives depend on you seducing them into low-carb food. Yeah. Lecturer David Critchley has been tasked to come up with a range of simple and economic dishes. I love that the most important bit of this evening is not down to a doctor, it's down to a chef. This is a carb clever meal. All the starchy beige carbs like potato replaced with a green fibery carb alternative like celeriac. But this was a whole week's food we're having in yes. one table. Yeah. Yes. The cauliflower with the chicken one night and you have the cottage pie another the chicken curry another night. Essentially, it's just everyday food with a very slight tweak. And it's like this. I love the visual of that because that gives me the illusion that I'm having my roasties. Yeah. Don't feel like I'm giving something up. I'm just... It's a lifestyle change. It's actually changing some of the things that I am eating. Dave, why are you here? Uh, basically, I've been type 2 diabetic for about 17, 18 years. I've had the fear of God put over me. People saying you'll lose your toes and fingers and your eyes and things, so I've been... Obviously, nobody wants that, do they? So this is serious stuff for our patients. I'm back in the kitchen with David to find out what's coming out next. Is this pudding? This is Ella. Hi, Ella. Ella's doing chocolate-covered strawberries. You still can have chocolate on this diet. It's not full of sugar. It's not the kind of terrible milk chocolate. And then the strawberries are, are fruit, so... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so great. All I good. would not have thought of that. I don't know what I thought you were going to serve for pudding, but I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. This is just one okay. of them. Somewhere along the way, there's something for everyone here, isn't there? There is. There is. And it's, again, it's just getting back to making sure that you're smart with your choices. Because there's always going to be a low-carb pudding out there for someone. So can I just ask, what does everyone think of the food? Stunning. Good. Stunning. Good. Yeah? Absolutely brilliant. So, at the end of this meal, does everyone feel optimistic about making this change to their lives? Yes. 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 Yeah, I yeah, think I'm in for it. It was my biggest worry that the food was going to be 
but I, I quite enjoyed what we've had tonight. I mean, I could eat everything on the... I don't mean everything, literally. <laughs> There's a lot at stake. Our team's health depends upon them sticking to low-carb food. For the next two weeks before we catch up again, but also for the long term too. I thought that was a really great start and hopefully it will be the motivation that our seven volunteers need to make some really good progress. If they and I are going to change the carbs we're eating, they still need to be satisfying and full of flavour. I'm back with dietitian Alison Barnes to get a few tips. Alison, we've got a healthy meal here, but you've kind of fiddled with the carbs, is that right? Yeah, that's okay. probably a good way of putting it. So sometimes when people are, are trying to cut things down in their diet, they think that they have to cut them out completely. Right. What we've tried to do here is just to be a bit smarter with the carbs. So this is some stuffed chicken thighs, they're stuffed with mushroom and onion. So where you might normally have potato, we've substituted that. So what we've used here is roast celeriac and squash. The squash is half the carbs that potato would be, and the celeriac is even lower. This has that nice, stodgy, carby fillingness, but for a mouthful of squash, it's like half a mouthful of potatoes. Exactly. So we've done a veggie curry here. OK. Um, so this has got its chickpeas, cauliflower and, and spinach and the curry itself. We've substituted the white rice for bulgur wheat this time. OK. It's still carby, but more of that carbohydrate is, is fibre. OK. Um, so the white rice um, has all of the fibre stripped from it, no, okay. no fibre at all. This is a, it's about a tenth fibre. I think if I wasn't paying attention, I don't think I'd even notice. Exactly. That's a very easy substitution to make. Yep. You've got loads of flavour from the curry. It's not very different to rice, is it? No. So the third main dish we've got is a lasagna. OK. But we've replaced the, the lasagna sheets, the pasta in there, with uh, aubergine. OK. Which means that we've, we've got fibre in there, but it's much, much lower in carbohydrate. What about pudding? Mm-hmm. So everybody likes a bit of a... Bit of a sweet treat. Right, so low-carb puddings to me are a waste of time. This is a key lime pie, but we've used nuts for the base there. So there's some hazelnuts and some almonds, just whizzed up in a food processor, and that makes the base. So the difference that that makes to this dessert, it's a tenth of the carbs that you would get from a digestive biscuit base. It's two to three times the fibre that you would get from a digestive biscuit okay. base, and it's a healthier type of fat as well. OK, so better fat much less carbs, much more fibre, so that's all good. That's it. I don't think anyone would say that that wasn't a good key lime pie. That is lovely. Being clever with your carbs isn't just about weight loss. It really could save your life. As well as helping type 2 diabetes, eating the right sort of carbs can significantly reduce your chances of getting bowel cancer too. This cancer is such a big killer that the NHS is now offering screening to older adults. Although I'm a little younger than the minimum age, I'm going to have a procedure called a colonoscopy. It involves a metre-long probe with a camera at the business end. Uh, and we can take my office. And I'm in surgeon Ken Park's hands. So you're all set? I'm ready to go. OK. Ken's looking for polyps while I'm on the gas and air. Just bear with us a second while we get round this corner. So, there's the image there oh, of the first me? part of the bow. Oh, it's a mega... It's an insane view, isn't it? Uh, what we can see is we can see the lining of the bowel here. Pretty normal looking, nice pink. We can see the blood vessels through the lining of the bowel. See the sort of Toblerone effect there? I mean, that's a hell of a Toblerone, isn't it? Yeah, it is a bit. How dangerous is bowel cancer? It is uh, a very significant cause of cancer death. Uh, and indeed, in the UK, it's the second commonest cause of cancer death. Really? We're seeing, yeah. Really? And we're talking particularly about bowel cancer. There is an association between obesity and bowel cancer. So when you're doing colonoscopies on people, you're yep. really looking for cancer. Is that, is that one of the main reasons cancer to do this? Cancer or the precancerous conditions. 
because bowel cancer is preventable in probably just over half the patients that develop it. It's preventable because we know that the sequence of events is that before a cancer develops, you will get a polyp. And a polyp's like a little warty growth in the lining of the bowel, which in itself is not going to um, cause significant health problems. We can remove those and not cause any problems. But the risk is that if you ignore that over the course of maybe 10 years or so, that starts to grow and become malignant and then you've got a bowel cancer. And that's why the emphasis on colonoscopy and bowel screening. And I just want to see the last little bit, and it's very important that we see this, because if I don't see it, I don't know that I've done a complete examination. OK. Uh, so, so apart from just the roughage, see my gut's moving, it's, yeah. it's also obesity, it's also about what I eat. Yeah. All of that's reducing my risk of bowel cancer. Of course, yeah. 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 So what's happening in our poo and in our guts can tell us if we're eating the right kind of carbs. And they're absolutely vital for making our bowels work properly. And how am I looking? Did you find anything? You're looking pretty good. I'm glad to say that you're pretty healthy. That's good. Research shows that one of your best ways of avoiding bowel cancer is to eat more foods high in fibre, the healthy carb. Eating the recommended 30 grams a day of fibre could reduce your risk of bowel cancer by a whopping 30%. Carbs affect many aspects of our health, and new science is revealing they can even affect our fertility. Studies are showing an association between carbohydrates and growing fertility problems. Hi. Is it Grace? It is. Pleased to meet you. Very, very nice to you. Thank you for having me. Grace Dugdale, a reproductive biologist, runs a program looking at the underlying causes of infertility in both women and men. Making a new human being is an energetic process. Uh, there's a new, you know, a whole new person being created, uh, and the components of that, the egg and the sperm, both need good energy. You have a poor diet, uh, and that starts to really disrupt that process and all the processes that are needed to successfully conceive a child. So you're really talking about um, the, the kind of metabolic biochemical processes inside the sperm and the egg. Yeah. And that those are shaped by among other things, the, the carbohydrates you're eating in your diet? Yes, absolutely. So if you eat refined carbohydrates, the sugars, the white bread, the white pasta, all the things that we kind of are starting to learn about, that basically rapidly converts into blood, sh blood sugar, then you have too much energy available, and that basically damages the battery of the cell that provides all the energy for the cell, and they are really important for both egg and sperm quality. How should people be changing their diets if they're trying to get pregnant? In terms of carbohydrate, they have the wholemeal versions. Lots of vegetables are very, very important, and the fibre in those vegetables are important. So it's the quality of carbohydrates and also not overdoing carbohydrates in general. Grace's message is to look carefully at the sort of carbs you're eating, and she's had considerable success teaching couples all about nutrition and food groups, especially carbs. Let's take a little look and see what's going on here. One of her successes is Emma, who conceived naturally after attending the support group. Beautiful picture there of the heart beating. Can you see that? We're here in the fertility clinic, so I'm guessing that it wasn't as easy for you to get pregnant as some couples. No, we've been trying for about 12 months, just over 12 months, um, went to our GP and got a referral here. Clearly you've made a number of changes to your lifestyle overall, but it sounds like the emphasis was on diet. And of those dietary changes, were a lot of them around the kind of carbs you were eating? Yeah, it was about the type of carbs, not about avoiding carbs, which I thought was quite interesting, because sometimes you hear about cutting carbs out completely, but that wasn't the message. Um, it was about thinking about which carbs you were going to have. But it's not only about getting pregnant, it's about having a healthy pregnancy, reducing the risk of miscarriage, and ultimately, of course, having a healthy baby. And if couples can conceive naturally without needing the high-tech IVF or other treatments that obviously we have everything here, but if it can happen in the bed rather than in the laboratory, it's much better all round for everybody. <laughs> so, too many of the wrong carbs can affect your ability to create new life. 
But now it seems you can also pass on your health problems to your children because too many of the wrong carbs can also alter your genes. So basically, what you do before you're conceived impacts your lifetime's predisposition to disease, and there's an impact through both the father and the mother. So lots of people think it's just about the women, but there can be changes in sperm as well that also impact health of the child. There are thousands of genes modified in the sperm of obese men. Really, actual genetic changes that you could potentially pass on to your kids? Yeah, absolutely. This is a growing research area that male factor problems can be passed on to the next generation through the modification of genes resulting from our damaging lifestyle. Wow, okay. We owe it to future generations to be carb clever. What we eat can impact our children before they've even been born. Otherwise, we could be programming our offspring to a lifetime of obesity, not by what they eat in the future, but by what we're eating right now. I think that's absolutely fascinating, that just by changing the quality of the carbs you're eating, you can not only improve your chances of getting pregnant, but also the long-term health of your child. And that seems to me to be really important information for anyone hoping to start a family. It's just over two weeks since I last saw our low-carb volunteers. During that time, they've been using social media to keep in touch, to share food ideas, and to egg each other along. If you want to follow our plan, maybe just to shed a few pounds, then why not form a group online it can make a real difference, helping you to stop falling off the wagon. I'm back in Kirby to see if any of our group have managed to turn their health problems around. So we haven't seen you all for two weeks. How has everyone been getting on? Good. Good. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Something I've actually enjoyed doing and actually found that I'm not actually hungry at all. So for not me, it's hungry. a significant, no, no significant change in what I'm used to eating and what I've been doing. So, and education wise, it's been brilliant. Mm. Did anyone really struggle? No. 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 Wow. Yeah. I do think that is amazing that you've got a group of people here who've been on not a diet, but have changed what they're eating yeah. for two weeks, who are not coming back going, I'm, I'm starving, I'm hungry, I hated this, this is miserable. Um, okay, impressive. These patients have all previously struggled losing weight, so how have they got on with our plan? So, Richard, uh, over this two-week period, uh, you've lost half a stone, and your HDL, your good cholesterol, has gone up by about 10%. Brilliant. Which is fantastic. Brilliant. And if you move on to Maureen, you've had half a stone weight loss in this two-week period. Mm -hmm. Your waistline has gone down by 10 centimetres, which is fantastic. Wow. Yeah. That's good. In fact, all of the overweight patients have done exceptionally well, considering they've been counting the carbs, not the calories. Each one has lost half a stone. For those with type 2 diabetes, Dr. Mazarani also measured their average blood sugar levels, their HbA1c, a key blood marker for a diabetic. So we'll do you, Neil, first. If you're a type 2 diabetic on three diabetic medications, your controls cluster's very poor, or it was when we started. But in the two-week period, you've had a 14% improvement in your HbA1c. Wow. So I'm 100% confident in another month or so, maybe three months, we should be on the way to reversing your type 2 diabetes. Well, well done. Yes, yeah. so well done. Fantastic. Yeah. Well done. So, Phil, over to you. So you're a type 2 diabetic as well. Over this two-week period, you've lost half a stone, your diabetic controls improved by 6%, and your fatty livers reduced again by 35%. So that's excellent as well. So Dave, you've been diabetic for a number of years now, haven't you? 17. 17 years. But the fantastic news here is, at the start of this programme, you were a type two diabetic, but you're now classed as a diabetic in part remission. So you're only a stone's throw from being diabetes in reversal, which is amazing. I'm amazed too because after 17 years on medication, it's looking like Dave can turn his type 2 diabetes around simply by being clever with his carbs. What do you think of that? I think it's fantastic. They're actually improving the health. 
Those are literally hard biochemical markers that we're finding in your bloods that are will have a huge, I mean, those are the important blood results for life expectancy. They are, yeah. So when we talk about stroke, heart disease, all the complications of diabetes, it's these numbers. What's been achieved in two weeks is pretty extraordinary. David's low-carb plan could potentially save lives and save the NHS millions of pounds a year in medication alone. Is it fair to say I think there are a lot of doctors throughout the UK who would simply not believe that this was possible? And, and I would say I'm one of them. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like this. No. For us as doctors, you become a doctor because you want to make a difference. And it makes me wonder what you're going to achieve in the next yeah. six months. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know the answer to this, but are you all planning to continue doing this? Yes, most definitely. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, look, really good luck. You have Thank done you. fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite that impressive. Those people have not only lost significant amounts of weight in two weeks, more importantly, they've improved things about their health that are literally saving their lives. Dr Unwin and Dr Mazarani have discovered something that has massive implications for the health of almost everyone in the UK, including me. Dr. Mazarani has already extended the low-carb plan across his surgery. And it's being rolled out online by the Royal College of General Practitioners as part of a wider programme using nutrition and diet to manage type 2 diabetes. It will soon be available to GPs across the whole of the UK. So why not start to become clever about the carbs you eat? by reducing some of the white and beige carbs, like potatoes, pasta, and the white bread. We all handle carbs a little differently, and it's important to eat a balanced diet. But if you're trying to lose a little weight, then it's worth considering the type of carbs you're eating, and not just obsessing about calories. The next time you're heading to the shops, have a think about what you're putting in your basket. If you reckon you're eating too many of the white or the beige carbs, you might want to try something like swapping white bread for whole grain varieties, like rye or sourdough. And give yourself enough time to prepare meals using fresh ingredients so that you don't have to rely on convenience foods. That way, you can lose weight, improve your health, and it doesn't have to cost a fortune. It's all about making carbs work for you.